Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Siva Mutakrishna. He is the Associate Vice President of Advanced Research for L'Oreal. Siva, I'm really excited to talk with you about innovation storytelling today. Me too, Katie. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me where your personal story of innovation began? I think, you know, I come from India. So, uh, you know, uh, I think the constraints uh, is considered the mother of innovation and as well as invention. Just to begin with, there's a slight difference between invention and innovation. Invention is just finding how something can be made to work. Innovation is how to put them to use and monetize them in one form or the other. So innovation started very young in my life. Because uh, when we found out how to make something work, we have to always be resourceful to, uh, you know, valorize uh, those materials. So I go to a scientific example because I don't want to give some personal example that was uh, pretty pragmatic at a street level. Uh, scientifically, I was in, uh, in in a lab in India. It's called the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai, where I spent some time after my master's degree. And uh, this lab did not uh, have a dedicated glass blower. But uh, we had some uh, inert atmosphere experiments to be carried out, and uh, I am not a glass blower. I was not trained in it. So I came up with some uh, you know, uh, contraptions that would work and get things done. And in this process, it was more the creativity. And uh, in fact, the story I told myself, then you can do it this way because somebody did a similar kind of a contraption to make something else work. That's what actually drove this. And uh, that would be my first example where I made a very sophisticated scientific experiment that would have required a very complex setup, very expensive setup. Uh, I was able to make it work with a very cheap set of uh, uh, regular parts and glass pieces available in the lab, glass tubes and stuff, and made it work. Uh, and created uh, uh, something very interesting in making nanoclusters made out of platinum and palladium. Wow, incredible. And so you saw something similar happen in, did you say it was not an adjacent industry and you sort of modeled your solution? Right, exactly. It's, it's really not an adjacent industry. It is far away. Uh, basically, if you think about uh, how you would uh, set concrete in a very high water flooded area, they create uh, a dry area, dry zone by using whatever is available in that area. Uh, in an agile constructions, that's what they do. So they were able to keep away moisture uh, for a temporary time when they pour the concrete down and let it solidify. So similarly, I was wondering if I have to mix two reagents through an inert uh, environment, instead of waiting for a a glove box or something that is fully inert, why can't I simply fill a balloon with argon and then with a tube and put it together and allow the argon to flow in and mix and uh, and make the reaction work? And uh, apparently it was a very common thing that organic chemists uh, did all the time. But at the time I was uh, not trained in organic chemistry in the lab. So uh, it was funny that when I showed that uh, to my friends uh, in organic chemistry, they said they were doing it all the time. (laughs) Sure, sure. And yet uh, thinking outside the box and and using some creativity helped you sort of reinvent it for for the purpose that you were looking at. Absolutely. So what brought you to L'Oreal? Uh, well, it's a very complex story, so I wouldn't get into it. Uh, I'm a person who flows with, uh, with with life as it comes. So uh, basically, whenever there is an opportunity, I measure time in a very unique way. Uh, this is my personal philosophy of time. Time is not something that's measured using a calendar or a clock. Time is something, uh, it is uh, the set of experiences you gain and the value you create uh, within a given space. So for example, uh, in 10 years, you can call 10 years as a measure of time, but then somebody could have achieved a lot of things in just one year that could normally be possible by somebody else only in 20 years. So what is time here? So for me, time is not uh, the regular meaning. Uh, I think time is simply the experience you can pack. So how I measure my success in every professional uh, journey, I look at what is my experience and what is the value I'm creating. And the time when I realized that my value creation has reached my potential, uh, where I don't think I would do any more disruptive shifts. I will only do incremental shifts. I try to look for the next adventure or mm-hmm. more often than not, the next adventure comes towards me. 
so uh, that's <laughs> yeah. how i was in uh, uh, it's like the teacher coming to visit you when you are ready as a student right the right teacher shows up when the student is ready so uh, i was in cincinnati i didn't know even procter and gamble was there in cincinnati uh, people would not believe me if i say that but it is the truth i am not from ohio i am from <laughs> india so i don't know the geography or the who are the big players in which city in ohio so when i ended up in cincinnati i didn't even have a clue procter and gamble was there so i ended up working for procter and then uh, as life would take me i went from there and did a post doc in ohio state then uh, came back to procter again and procter i worked there for a couple of years learned a lot amazing uh, learning ground then uh, procter gave me the opportunity to relocate to singapore build something in singapore learn a lot and deliver some business and again move again within the business then moved to india again in procter and gamble Uh, then luck would happen uh, one of the indian companies wanted to hire me uh, for a succession planning and i moved there and spent about one and a half years and uh, since i was a resident of the united states wanted to come back and l'oreal had a opening uh, to come back and that's how i came back to l'oreal so all along it's just the right opportunity and the right timing things automatically fell in place how do you think innovation cultures are different around the world since you've had such an intercontinental experience in mm-hmm. research and development mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think um, first and foremost there is two fundamental systems in my opinion globally of innovation one is a systemic innovation other one i would call i would use a hindu an indian term a hindi term called jugaad no uh, this, there is no equivalent word in uh, english just that you can care you can call in english uh, maybe uh, ben franklin was the best jugaad practitioner you know mm-hmm. make it work uh, doesn't matter so ben franklin i would call as the proponent of jugaad in the western world it's pronounced as jugaad so there are only two types of innovations one is the make it work philosophy the other one is a process uh, you know innovation is a process so um, if i look at every country in the world each country automatically falls into their own uh, uh, definitions of innovation and they can be classified within these two segments and uh, it is interestingly very much tied to their food so if you if you eat uh, the way in which people make prepare food and eat food tells you whether they are a process driven culture or whether they are a jugaad driven culture so for example it is a certain way you serve the food a certain way you eat it and the very picky about all of that that's a naturally a process centric culture easily you can classify japan and uh, certain aspects of china certain parts of china some european cultures they all fall into this very process centricity this is the way to hold the knife and this is the way to hold the fork and that's how you have to eat it and and that's a, that is cultures where the process domination is very visible and uh, here comes in the united states i think if united states is one of the best country of jugaad where uh, hey i don't care about how you eat the pizza in italy uh, we just fold it and pick it up in our hands and eat it so you just make it work uh, it is that kind of a mindset and uh, this is the broad two difference in innovation but the key difference for me is uh, how they come along together the process innovation is important for you to scale up the business scale up the uh, value of the innovation and uh, the uh, the messy part the jugaad is required for the creativity so whichever country has the messy part the creativity is very high for example india india is a, is a very naturally a jugaad land because you have to make it work there is always a shortage of resource so in one form or the other the population is big uh, it's a wealthy nation but just because of the population the per capita wealth is small so uh, you have to make it work within that so the constraint puts you under a lot of pressure to make contractions that work in a very quick and dirty way and it makes it work but when you scale it up you need to then adapt process that is when you can control the quality and give you the correct output for innovation so broadly speaking globe can be divided into two uh, between jugaad and process but for me culmination of the two together is what creates the biggest of innovations i can see that and you know so much of what we're interested in in this podcast is storytelling and communications around innovation and how how storytelling can help accelerate the pace of change and so do you think different storytelling techniques are are prominent when a culture is more process oriented in its innovation approach versus jugaad absolutely uh, first of all let me start with uh, the key of stories the most important part of storytelling is the stories you tell yourself right every morning you like it or not you are actually telling stories to yourself 
mostly subconsciously because we have made a habit of telling a certain stories to ourselves hey i am tall i am brown uh, i am i am i am thin i am heavy uh, uh, i am flexible i am not I, I, all these are stories you say to yourself and uh, it starts very young in childhood i believe because uh, when my grandma showed me the sky and say hey that is that constellation really the constellation doesn't exist there it's a story she just connected a random set of dots and showed that it looks like a big spoon so you call it the dipper so that is how uh, you create a story for yourself mm-hmm. so and then if i if i really put those uh, uh, experiences in the computer and store those experiences as experiences there is no story then it's not a human so we have to make those experiences come together and uh, then the mosaic forms an image and the image is what is the story you carry with yourself and we evolve as a child to adult and to old age with various stories and memories and half of it is a lie by the way most of the stories are lie which means it's not it's they are very innocuous lie they are not really malicious in any form but these are vital lies and daniel goldman beautifully called this as uh, vital lies and simple truths right you got to tell yourself these pictures so coming to innovation it is the same thing when you put four or five data points in front of you uh you are connecting them in some way to tell a story you can put take the same set of data points and tell three or four different types of stories and which story you say and which story you act upon you know, telling is one thing then you follow with an action on the story that is what will determine how successful or poor your innovation model is and uh coming back to the uh, jugad versus the process innovation the stories are very different the process always looks for failure modes the jugad always looks for optimism so mm-hmm. that's very fundamental difference between the two the process is that to prevent failure it's that to make it efficient which is another form of saying that i won't fail in losing my time i won't fail in losing my quality that is what process is meant for it's a failure prevention mechanism that's a great point too and it's it's meant to reduce risk right yes exactly so risk mitigation is uh, is the whole idea of process that's why for scaling you need the process however if you think about jugad it's all about fantasy you are fantasizing in a way or not like when i was looking at the concrete being poured into a small contracted cylinder to keep away the water to set up a particular uh, a pillar or a beam inside a, inside a wet uh, land uh, i was just imagining oh uh, that means i didn't even think whether water and air is going to behave in the same way if oxygen and water are same size in their uh, in, in their radius of gyration i don't care about all those physics and chemistry but it was just a leap of faith and imagination that uh, if if that was uh, you know if one could apply that in the in the construction why can't i put that into a glass wall you know that leap of faith is more about a fan, almost a fantastic optimism and and that is what is uh, the story that you got to focus on when you are looking at uh, creative aspects of innovation And so really leveraging both, being able to express the sort of creative, futuristic, opportunistic storyline, as well as thinking about the avoidance of risk and creating a narrative about really process and feasibility. Really, the balance of both of those is critical to an innovation story. Uh, absolutely and uh, and it is so uh, interesting when in my travels around the world and working with so many cultures more than 65 countries of scientists uh, i have worked with uh, in my career now and i can tell like uh, it's 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 fascinating doesn't matter where they come from people automatically gravitate to one or the other styles the people uh, who are generally on to the very fantastic and creative sides are those who struggle to scale up and people who are very good to generally scale up are those who struggle to fantasize mm-hmm. and uh, and there are a very few people whom uh, i call as the ambidextrous people in the middle who can do a little bit of both and uh, and, and these people are the essential uh, integrators they are the bridge between the two extreme and uh, a success of an organization depends on how many people you have in the middle as well as how many people you have on both other extremities you need to have a fine balance between all three What advice do you have? I'm sure so many of the stakeholders and leaders and engineers in the innovation community are listening to this podcast and kind of placing themselves within this narrative. So they are either falling on the more process-oriented side of in- their approach to innovation or and can you spell the the word Jugad is J U G A D Okay, so on the Jugad side, more futuristic and, and opportunistic, well, I think we're placing ourselves 
in this narrative as we hear it, what advice do you have for Jugald oriented innovators in terms of helping them tell innovation stories and think about innovation in a way that they don't uh, that they can leverage their creativity, but also keep in mind that the realism that's required to to get buy in for their idea. It is all about uh, the stage in which you want to make your innovation. For example, now I'm managing very upstream R and D uh, activities in advanced research. We work a lot in very upstream work. In my previous job, I was managing uh, factories. I was the company head of quality. So I cannot apply the same principles in two of these places. I don't want Jugad in a factory. I want to minimize Jugad in factory because I don't want the improvisations uh, along the way where like you make a contraption. Yes, it can be done as a stopgap measure when there is a full line stopping. Now I can just temporarily put some duct tapes and make it work. Uh, that's okay for a day if I have a plan clearly to get this sorted out and then do a root cause analysis and put the process in place to prevent those uh, failures. However, when I come to very early phase experimentation, I cannot paralyze myself by thinking about the process involved in the scale-up and the efficiencies and the losses. Uh, that will paralyze me. So every stage of innovation, we need to look at the uh, risk versus probability analysis. If you do this kind of a jugad, what are the risks and what's the probability? Same way, if you do this jugad in a downstream process, in a scale-up situation, what are the risks and what are the probability of the risk happening? And once you are very flexible, you are agile, you have to be deft in this to go between the two extremes. So what I have tried to develop over my career is try to be in the center and, uh, and, and more like be reactive or responsive to whichever side the particular problem and the question is, uh, is, uh, is there in front of you. So I think having a very centrist mindset is very useful. That would be one of the key advice. And the second thing is uh, be very comfortable with, uh, with, changing your, uh, with changing your strategy from jugad to process uh, because the problem evolves and the maturity of the problem evolves and the, uh, and the stake of the problem also evolves. Sometimes the stakes of the problem is very high. Sometimes it is low and the changes along the course of the problem solving. So key is flexibility and populate your team with two types of people, those that have the jugad mindset and those who have the process mindset and maintain the active tension between the two mindsets. It's very important to keep the healthy tension between the two mindsets. That makes so much sense. I'm also thinking this is a really interesting sort of parable for what we see amongst big corporations at the enterprise level working to innovate and also startups. And we could sort of put them into these two camps that startups um, embody the Jugad mindset and that enterprise organizations embody the process mindset. And so could you speak a little bit to, do, do you sort of see that same parallel there in terms of a future where we're, we as regions, we as a world are really trying to leverage both and, and create partnerships and venture opportunities? That's a fascinating uh, question. I think uh, you, you hit upon a very, very interesting observation there. You, you are spot on when you are uh, trying to build something from scratch and trying to survive. You don't care about uh, what is the process because if your, your business card may say you are the CEO, but you may also be very well the janitor of the office if you are only a three people company. You know, <laughs> So, uh, so, it, it, so you're, you're just making it work. And in fact, that flexibility is what pays your bills and that is what allows you to establish yourself. And then you start worrying about the scale. But what gets you from this starting point of two, three people company to let us say you make a 300 people company, you can no longer uh, be doing the job of the janitor because you have uh, more value addition to add other than that. Not that it is any less to do the job of a janitor, but, but it is just to say that like uh, you can hire somebody and give them a job to do that and you can take care of it. Mm -hmm. So you, you are absolutely right. Uh, as the organization's complexity evolves, uh, specialization starts. It is actually nothing unusual. This is exactly what happened in the Industrial Revolution. Initially, there were uh, generalists, and then specialization emerged, and then the, uh, the generalization came back once again. It's a cycle between specialization and generalization. Even Einstein's relativity theory, he first had the general theory of relativity before he had the special theory of relativity. And, uh, but, but in reality, when he was able to establish the mathematical proof, he was not able to do it in the same order. 
he actually first had the special theory of relativity because he could apply it for only the photo the photoelectric effects then uh, he wanted to expand from there and then he built on to the other gravity modules and then he had the general theory of relativity so the two are a continuum you go from specialization to generalization and what is interestingly is the big corporation which survives maximum shocks such as the great recession or the great depression of the 1930s they are the ones which had uh, a confined jugaad so in other words they somehow have codified the mindset of jugaad the company itself will have a massive structural process in place but there will be some wild cards inside the company which will be allowed to practice jugaad and if you take any company uh, even if you take the good to great analysis uh, of uh, jim collins book you can see very clearly that uh, that certain of the companies that had this flexibility of both process and jugaad were at a very significant advantage my worry now with a uh, lot of the legalities and the liabilities and all those uh, generalization of policies we have put ourselves way too much on the process constraint especially in the western world while i am not against this because they are there for a safety reason but more often than not it's a knee jerk reaction after a couple of safety incidents then so many uh, extra protections and stuff are put in place for every little thing and as a result what happens uh, you are so constrained that you can't even try a very little deviation from anything and unless we really release those uh, constraints and, uh, and and balance the risk versus uh, probability in a very smart way i think our rate of innovation will will start to stagger and uh, it will not really grow and uh, what is paradoxical to me is many of the developing countries which are trying to move into the uh, into the forefront they are also not able to come up with because they are on the other end of the spectrum they completely lack any processes so they believe that everything can be done by on the go kind of things and that doesn't work so this is where we stand in smaller organizations yes there is a lot of jugaad but uh, they need to start building in processes uh, not just thinking today about uh, 200 300 people they may want to think about what happens when they have a 2000 people workforce or what happens when their consumer base goes from near 20000 to uh, 2 million or 5 million consumers or customers and and that is how the processes have to be a line way of improving it's a continuous improvement uh, that is the key it should be the continuous improvement improvement of the process where jugaad should have some room to play in the smaller scale and when you are deploying it in the larger scale there is less of a jugaad not zero and more of process inside l'oreal in that brand division how do you balance this you know what what's can you tell us about some of the initiatives or projects that you're working on and, and the ways that you do do you use a stage gate process inside your innovation teams uh, i can talk to uh, l'oreal spirit L'Oreal is actually a truly uh, a company that has somehow balanced jugaad and process fairly well and uh, it probably goes back to the founding father who was a chemist himself Eugene Schuler and uh, he somehow uh, although he was a chemist he always maintained his own lab even though he became the ceo of a company that became 80 90 million dollars or uh, euros or franc in those days in the 1940s uh, he he already had by the time uh, uh still he was practicing time in the in the lab he used to come to the labs very often so in the lab he maintained his jugaad mindset while in running the business he was in the process mindset so uh, i think it was there in the dna of the company since it was founded uh, some 110 years ago and uh, where we stand today i think uh, that is still very much in the company but i would definitely say uh the jugaad uh, has a little bit of an upper hand in certain parts of the company than the other parts of the company and uh, and and what we are constantly striving is to find the balance uh, we don't call it jugaad it is just a term i use because uh, i am coming from india and i am a big fan of the term and i wish i would make it more popular because there is no other equivalent word in any other language for it to my knowledge and uh, and i think in my case of advanced research our goal is to find materials of the future like 5 years 10 years into the future how would the material integrate with your electronic systems into your digital environments how will they do uh, very uh, uh, responsive to your environment uh, be smart at uh, those kind of material so here uh, when we want to test these material we cannot wait to test it in the in the process because the process involves humans you have to go through safety clearances and whole lot of things so we and, and we are, we are very strict about not doing animal testing at all so how do we come up with our creative solutions to test them 
before we start investing a lot in testing them in uh, in the in the real process which we have to test them before launching a product so that is where a lot of jugad comes in handy we are able to practice it put some surrogates put some very interesting tricks in, in the trade to uh, really test them at a cheaper price how do we uh, fast fail uh, no uh, uh, fail very fast and uh, and get the maximum learning from a single failed experiment how do we design such experiment that is where the jugad mindset helps us a lot absolutely i agree with you the term is so helpful and i i love that you have borrowed it from one culture and you're trying to sp- sort of amplify its presence i i think you should write a book about that, that already there is a book huh? <laughs> <laughs> already there is a book uh, a professor from oxford university already wrote a book called jugad innovation and uh, but i i i do write plan to write uh, uh, a book on the topic because that professor being not really from india i didn't grow up uh, as ha- has a misunderstanding about the term how it is uh, to be practiced but uh, maybe some day when i have the time i should sit down and write you're right <laughs> so tell us you know building materials of the future how do you leverage storytelling inside of your innovation teams do you feel that uh story plays a role in in leveraging jugad and that mindset i probably think it's all stories right <laughs> it's not just telling stories it's all stories why because uh, i you know how we do about uh, how we go about doing this work we need publications from various professors around the world we uh, go through patents you know this 5 years ago uh, the data is available the us patent office granted approximately some 14 or 15 million patents which is crazy number of patents mm-hmm. so there is no way anybody can make a logical sense of these patents the only way you have to do is you can say hey why is this particular company filing this patent at this time uh, probably they are trying to launch a product without our knowledge we just told a story i just ended up telling a story that there is a product uh, conceived there is a consumer benefit there is a market for it that's why this company has invested so much money to make some eight or nine patents so when we look at uh, information and connect them together it's stories which helps us make sense it is stories that helps us create hypothesis It, uh, we don't call them stories we call them hypothesis hypothesis is nothing but a plot yes it's absolutely a story so you are you are testing whether the plot is true or not so uh, and uh, so in every stage um, it's not your knowledge that's going to save you knowledge is history knowledge is past knowledge is all about what we already knew about and uh, what allows us to further knowledge it's actually imagination and uh, without stories you cannot have room for imagination so i tell my two teams very often i i i am very choiceful about my words when they when i talk to them i ask them what do you think about this idea next i ask them what do you feel you could do with this idea so there is a very big difference between the two when i am talking science and process that is thinking when i am talking imagination and storytelling that is feeling so it's without that i have never seen someone make a breakthrough so in fact when i interview candidates i look for one key trait how are they able to put their technical knowledge into a story and and it's very important and if they cannot do that in a very coherent manner uh, and cannot uh, go between logic and story back and forth i think then they have not mastered their technology sufficiently enough i would love to hear i think some examples or i know you probably can't share specific you know projects or, or prototypes or concepts but could you share an example of a moment where someone on your team grew in their ability to flow between the data and the evidence and the way that they're communicating it there was uh, an incident where we made a product we made a prototype and uh, the debate was uh, this prototype may not be stable in a certain form of package so the regular engineering mindset would say hey take these five six different packages put uh, make a design of experiments create a matrix of all the permutations and combinations and throw them in and put them into the stability pull them out and check them regularly so uh, this is a very linear mindset and it would take uh, almost like 60 or 70 experiments to do but uh, however there was uh, one of the team members who came up with a very interesting story saying hey you know i have actually seen that particular kind of packaging commonly used in this kind of material uh, in this kind of chemistries so i am imagining there is a good reason why they do that so probably 
this kind of material is compatible with that and this is not compatible with this so why don't we just do a binary testing between the two and uh, voila we went from a 70 experimental design to just two or three experiments wow and uh, this leap of faith was very powerful yes if they fail in that so what they just lost a day but That's at right. least uh, uh, but if, but they at least gave themselves uh, a lottery ticket in hand where they if they won they won a jackpot That's right. Yes. Yes. And so it was the ability to borrow an insight from another uh, another product or another package design and and apply that thinking to this particular challenge and and have a lean mindset at the same time to say yeah. you know 60 or 70 experiments is is too many. What else can we do? Yeah. It's a form of humility, right? because uh, it doesn't start with the belief that i know it i can design it i have a phd uh, it's not that instead hey, what are others doing how are they working on it ah, here is a grocery store uh, how did the chips company uh, work on this particular type of package ah, it's chips you know it sold for a dollar come on you know that's not how you look at it same way uh, you travel in uh, thailand and you see how they made a package instantly out of palm leaf or some other leaf and uh, and wrapped uh, some hot uh, momos or something for you to eat you know uh, that's a, that's a great observation if you are a very good uh, curious scientist you observe these little things in various places and see how you can uh, uh, apply somewhere it's more like a, you know an, a mechanic a, a car mechanic uh, a good car mechanic will constantly update the toolbox but uh, he or she will not care about uh, who is uh, going to bring what car to the store uh, they will just keep updating the toolbox and when the car comes they just uh, through permutation combination and through experiments and guesses uh, they would use the tool and try to solve the problem a similar question to kind of lean, keep leaning into this line of thinking what advice do you have for innovation leaders as they try to identify team candidates who really have that ability to translate technical information into clear or compelling storylines see somehow the modern uh, hiring processes have uh, started unconsciously self selecting hiring of people of similar cultural and socio economic backgrounds so uh, uh, and also conformities of big universities so if uh, we start screening resumes from hey you know, this person is from an ivy league school so it must be good and uh, that's your starting point I think we need to throw this model into garbage first of all because uh, uh, we need to start looking at candidates from a very holistic viewpoint and be very comfortable with people who are very different than you and uh, and that's so important and diversity for me is uh, not uh, just at the level of gender race or color or uh, or nationalities or whatever uh, I think it's about thinking diversity of thought process diversity of approaching problems so look for people who are diverse in thinking and it is very very uncomfortable to accept the diversity of thinking because most often than not it is not race which divides people it's diversity in thinking mm-hmm. people are very uncomfortable with people who think differently yes. and, uh, and 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 innovation uh, suffers when people start thinking very similarly yes. homogeneous thinking is the enemy of innovation and uh, and that is why when i look at resumes i i first tell them hey don't even talk about uh, your school how great it is and uh, which background you come from uh, what's your pedigree all those are absolutely useless information and uh, the hiring groups uh, the hiring managers should be very conscious about this bias and all of us have biases and we got to be very watchful about this bias of uh, of social economic status it's very sad and uh, interesting people uh, from a certain set of mannerisms say i take a candidate for dinner and let us say this person is from a very very low socio economic background and did not know a certain sort of table manners this is going to hold against the candidate unfortunately in a very unconscious way and uh, we need to be careful to stay away from the bias i think now more than ever here in 2020 at least especially in america embracing and trying to understand people of differing viewpoints is more important perhaps now than than uh, ever before absolutely and absolutely. It, it applies to innovation of course it applies to any kind of of change or ways that we're going to be able to advance as a society so um so so i'm i'm grateful for that advice that's that's a great perspective to share thank you um siva you know 
from the innovator's perspective, do you have any other advice you'd like to share about how they can be empowered to tell effective innovation stories? The first thing for me is uh, acknowledge that story is not meant to be a scientific perfection. And also acknowledge that there are a certain element of uh, non-factual content in stories. Uh, most of them get into trouble when they start using storytelling, especially in innovation and science, is because uh, they don't give this disclaimer. This is very important. And why this disclaimer is important is not for any legal reasons or any uh, professional reasons. First and foremost, it is for ourselves because we release ourselves from the constraints we throw to ourselves on, on uh, what is the story I can say and what is the holy grail assumptions that I'm going to break. Because without breaking holy grail assumptions, you can never have breakthrough innovations. So first, permitting yourself with this is very vital. Second, stay extremely curious and humble. And by humility, I don't mean to say that talk less, say that I am meek, I am weak, or uh, oh, uh, using me in the place of I. That is not humility. Humility is willingness to be corrected by anybody and willingness to learn from anybody. And, uh, and, and that is very important. And staying curious. You can, you can learn and pick up ideas from anywhere around you. Anywhere, in your vacation, in, in, in the farmer's market, in, uh, in, in a village in China, uh, in, in some parts of Thailand, you can pick it up from anywhere and travel, travel around, visit different cultures, spend time uh, with them and, and look at it. Don't go and uh, tell something nonsensical in Asia. Oh, oh, I found a McDonald's. I really found a real food. Hey, come on. You know, that's not the way you express your humility in the first place, you know, uh, and, right. and, and that is uh, that is a fundamental arrogance. So that needs to be turned off if you ever want to be a good innovator. So I think just these handful of guidelines, I wouldn't call them even advice because advice sounds uh, in its own right to be arrogant. So I don't want to sound that way. It is just a thought process. It's just a framework. That's right. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's great advice about the fact that humility is not you know, necessarily about not speaking up or not adding your voice, but it is about being willing to take correction or take feedback and take it to heart um, and, and work to really understand and, and value the opinions and, and viewpoints of others. Mm -hmm. Siva, I, I'm so grateful to have had this conversation with you on the podcast. I, it's incredible to to learn about Jugad and these different mindsets that can help us really understand what our proclivities are as innovators and how we can storytell um, to either amplify those proclivities or try to work across them with people who maybe have a different approach and mindset towards innovation. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 